Hello there. Welcome to this uh, third edition of the Paris Peace Forum, and particularly to this session entitled Towards Blue Governance, Bringing the High Seas Treaty Over the Finish Line. My name is Jose Maria Figueres. I was the co-chair of the Global Ocean Commission. I am the chairman of Ocean Unite, and I have the privilege of being your moderator in this session, in which we have four extraordinary discussion leaders to shed more light on what this third implementing agreement under UNCLOS, the law of the sea, is all about. We have uh, first Ambassador Rina Lee from Singapore, who is also the president of the Governmental Conference on Marine Biological Diversity for Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction, also referred to as BBNJ. We also have with us Her Excellency Anique Gerardin, the Minister for Marine Affairs from France. Thirdly, we have Sir Richard Branson, fabulous and famous entrepreneur, but also a very strong environmentalist and an advocate for Ocean Issues, the founder of Ocean Unite. And we also have EU Commissioner Sinkovicius, Commissioner for Environment, Ocean and Fisheries. If there is one thing, friends, where we need a lot more governance, it is with respect to the ocean. Yes, we have UNCLOS, what is known as the Law of the Seas, the UN Convention, uh, for the law of the seas that precisely is almost celebrating its birthday today, 38 years. It came into effect on November the 16th, almost to the date, 1982. And under UNCLOS, we have been able to negotiate two very important implementing agreements. But we are still lacking a third implementing agreement, which is the one that has to do with the governance of the high seas and marine life in those high seas. Now, last year, the Paris Peace Forum chose the High Seas Alliance, an international coalition of NGOs, as one of its 10 scale-up projects in the hope that they would be able to usher more uh, convening power uh, and bring more opinions to the table to help the political process in negotiating this third implementing agreement. What is it all about? It is about governance of the high seas. The high seas are 43% of the surface of the planet. They are fully two thirds of the ocean. And if we listened to the scientists, the scientists would probably tell us, declare, the entirety of the high seas, a marine protected area. And you will see the bonus of doing that in economic terms as nations with EEZs benefit from the replenishment of life in the ocean. If we listen to the economists, economists would probably say, that is the thing to do, follow the science but also because the numbers speak to that reality. Less than 10% of global fish catch is catched in the high seas. It is done so by less than a dozen countries that only are able to do so because of the subsidies that their fleets receive. Less than 1% of total employment uh, in the fishery industry is engaged in fishing in the high seas. So it doesn't make any economic sense either. Now. Politically, this is where we have the challenge, and that is where we're going to be listening from our discussion leaders to see where the process is and how we can help it along. Let me then begin by um, asking a question of you, Ambassador Lee. You are the president of uh, this intergovernmental conference. Uh, there have been already three events in this intergovernmental conference, we're going into the fourth stage. Could you please be so kind as to share with us what is the status of the negotiations at this point in time and whether you believe that we will be able to finally get this 
over the finish line in 2021. Well, thank you very much, sir. And good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, let me uh, say thank you to the organizers for their very kind invitation to me to participate uh, in this program. So the issue of biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, also known as BBNJ, it's actually a very long title, has been under discussion in the UN for several years now. And in 2017, the General Assembly took the decision to convene the Intergovernmental Conference, also known as the IGC, to develop uh, the legally binding instrument under UNCLOS, which many refer to as the High Seas Treaty. Now, although we refer to it as the High Seas Treaty, in fact, it will cover all areas beyond national jurisdiction. So it will include the seafloor as well. In our mandate, it was decided that we should initially hold four sessions from 2018 to 2020. And as you pointed out, our fourth session was supposed to be in spring of this year, um, but we had to postpone it because of the pandemic. So we are likely to hold our fourth session in the second half of 2021, with the aim of closing as much of the draft treaty text as possible. That's where we are in terms of the formal process. Informally, during this extended intersessional period, delegations have not remained idle. Indeed, most delegations have recognized the need to keep the momentum of discussions going. So there's a whole range of uh, activities going on during this period. With the invaluable help of our very able facilitators and the UN Secretariat, we've organized an intersessional work program and we are approximately at the halfway mark of the uh, intersessional work program. Other interested delegations and organizations, including the High Seas Alliance, have also been organizing Zoominars, workshops, discussions, etc., all of which are geared towards driving a better understanding of the issue and the possible solutions. So moving into 2021 and the preparations for the fourth session, one aspect that I think will be helpful for all delegations is to consider how to stitch the various disparate parts together. And all this intersessional work that's going on actually bodes well for our fourth session. Delegations continue to be actively engaged in the process in the face of the pandemic and the thousand and one tasks that governments must undertake to tackle this pandemic. The fact that we have a full calendar of activities indicates that governments continue to place a priority on this issue of BBNG. But beyond the specific issues that delegations are working on, the fact that delegations remain engaged with one another and with the process reflects a wider understanding of the importance of all countries coming together and exploring solutions to issues that confront us as a whole. And I think that the pandemic has taught us that now, more than ever, we cannot retreat into ourselves, but must reach out and find ways to work with one another to achieve positive outcomes, and in our case, achieve positive outcomes for our oceans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Lee, and we'll be coming back to you in a, in a few minutes. Uh, if I may now uh, go to you, uh, Minister Girardin. You are responsible for France's maritime strategy. And France has been a strong supporter of a very high quality uh, third implementing agreement. Why is this so important to France? And what do you see as the prospects of being able to finally get this over the finish line next year, 2021? Alors, 
Monsieur le, le commissaire, euh, Madame l'ambassadrice, Mesdames et Messieurs, euh, Merci beaucoup, euh, Madame l'ambassadrice, d'avoir rappelé, et c'est important, euh, le caractère crucial euh, de cette négociation visant donc à finaliser notre travail en 2021, euh, traité de, de, de l'ONU, donc dit BBNG, nous l'appelons comme ça, auquel la France, vous le savez, est particulièrement euh, attachée. Moi, je suis heureuse de voir que l'océan est devenu un sujet qui occupe le plus haut niveau euh, de, de l'agenda international et puis également le plus haut niveau euh, de mobilisation au sein des différents euh, États. La France dispose, vous le savez, du deuxième domaine maritime mondial avec 11 millions de kilomètres carrés. Et au-delà du chiffre, et je l'ai toujours dit, euh, il y a bien cette volonté de responsabilité euh, de la France dans euh, à la fois les euh, débats que nous avons et, et les aboutissements que nous devons euh, mettre en place ensemble, mais également, euh, bien sûr, euh, sur une vision euh, des euh, océans euh, pour une protection dans le futur. Au-delà des chiffres et des données euh, géographiques, c'est bien sûr euh, dans le quotidien des Français euh, une identité culturelle, un attachement euh, viscéral que nous avons effectivement euh, euh, à la mer, aux océans. C'est un atout à la fois naturel et, euh, et économique, mais cela donne aussi, euh, bien sûr, euh, des responsabilités que le président de la République français euh, souhaite que nous euh, assumions totalement. Il a invité d'ailleurs euh, en 2019 la communauté européenne et internationale à explorer euh, de nouvelles approches pour une meilleure protection de l'espace maritime au-delà de la juridiction nationale. La France est en première ligne, euh, aux côtés de l'Union européenne et des autres pays les plus ambitieux dans la négociation euh, du traité de protection de la biodiversité euh, en haute mer, dit euh, BBNG. La science montre que euh, les océans sont interconnectés, L'écosystème océanique est également reconnu comme tel dans le préambule de, de l'accord de, de Paris. Il y a aujourd'hui un déficit d'encadrement des activités en haute mer impactant la, la biodiversité. La haute mer est donc une zone où la gouvernance est insuffisante. Nous sommes nombreux à le dire et nous sommes nombreux à vouloir trouver des solutions pour mieux protéger ce bien commun que nous avons, et j'insiste sur ce bien commun qui est l'océan. Effectivement, moi, je, je voudrais ici rappeler le concept très important selon nous et celui qu'il faut défendre, la notion donc de bien commun. Ça rouvre l'idée que l'océan est une, ou a une importance vitale pour les générations actuelles, mais aussi pour les générations futures, pour l'humanité dans, dans son ensemble. Par conséquent, j'estime que chaque État, la France estime que chaque État, chaque acteur économique, chaque communauté de personnes et chaque individu doit partager la responsabilité de protéger cet océan, ce bien commun, de le conserver et de l'utiliser, bien sûr, dans l'intérêt de tous. Alors, reconnaître dans le préambule de, du traité BBNJ, euh, comme nous le proposent euh, aujourd'hui les travaux qui ont été menés, que l'océan est un bien commun, n'attribuera pas, et il faut effectivement le dire, de nouveaux droits euh, sur l'océan. C'est la peur de certains, de certains États, il faut les entendre, mais il faut aussi, euh, bien sûr, les, les rassurer. Cette dynamique, elle n'a d'intérêt que si euh, nous sommes nombreux à porter euh, la cause de ce euh, bien commun. Le bien commun il ne fait pas référence euh, à un régime juridique spécifique et n'apporte donc pas euh, de conséquences euh, juridiques non plus. Cette approche, elle doit être en réalité euh, une sensibilité, une mobilisation euh, des actions de, de, des États pour reconnaître une responsabilité commune sur l'océan euh, en matière de protection, de conservation et d'utilisation durable de sa biodiversité marine. C'est une obligation euh, strictement morale euh, et euh, bien sûr euh, une, une obligation aussi politique que nous prendrons euh, les uns et les autres, une, euh, une, un engagement adressé à tous les États et à travers eux bien sûr à leurs concitoyens et nous savons combien nos concitoyens aujourd'hui sont exigeants euh, en la matière ou tout du moins je peux le dire au nom des Français et au nom euh, des, euh, des Européens que je côtoie et qui attendent euh, de véritables résultats euh, en 2021 sur nos euh, négociations et nos échanges. C'est aussi donc une responsabilité pour euh, toutes les institutions multilatérales, sectorielles et régionales, euh, qui couvrent les mers. Elles doivent jouer le jeu, le jeu de la coopération, du partage, 
en tissant avec euh, le nouvel instrument BBNJ des relations euh, qui permettront une action efficace et, euh, et concertée. C'est en particulier le cas pour les outils de la gestion euh, de gestion par zone, y compris, et vous l'avez cité tout à l'heure, les aires marines protégées. Nous considérons ainsi que l'océan est un, et nous promouvons la devise « un océan à traiter ». Voilà pour ma première réponse. Madam Minister, thank you very much for uh, your uh, sharing your perspectives with us. You mentioned the public common good, the high seas is a public common good. And I want to thank you, uh, Madam Minister, for your position and for France's position with respect to getting marine protected areas around Antarctica. Uh, you, France, and the EU are the proponents of the East Antarctica MPA. Uh, and your leadership in that cause is very much appreciated. So, Sir Richard Branson, uh, let me turn to you, uh, Richard. Uh, so nice to see you again doing battle for the ocean, this time the high seas. Uh, you are, of course, uh, a terrific entrepreneur, but I would say you are also an entrepreneur with respect to the environment and the protection of the ocean, the founder of Ocean Unite. Why is this treaty, Richard, so important for business? And how can business get behind it to get it over the finish line? Well, thanks, Jose. Um, and yeah, it's true. Uh, it's not a secret that I'm a huge lover of the oceans. Um, and I also enjoy the privilege of spending so much of my life close to the ocean. Um, but my concern is not just driven by uh, my personal passion for the ocean. Um, considering the ocean's enormous role in the global economy and to sustain life on our planet, I'm also concerned as a business leader. A healthy ocean means a healthy future. And the ocean produces at least 50% of our oxygen. And the seas store massive amounts of heat and carbon. And some estimates put the ocean's annual contribution to global GDP at $70 trillion. Tens of millions of jobs depend on fisheries and tourism. 90% of global trade volume relies on ocean shipping. The list goes on and on. And without a healthy ocean and without an agreement on how to protect large areas of it, we are waging a huge gamble on the future of our children and grandchildren. And that's not a risk I want to take. Let me add that this treaty is also important for another reason. At a time when we are reminded of the dangers of unilateralism on a daily basis, there is no better example than the climate and ocean uh, crises to highlight the need for international cooperation and multilateralism. We will only be able to tackle these challenges if we set aside our differences, reject narrow national interests, and if we all stand together as one. Richard, thank you. I will come back to you on some of those thoughts in a, in a couple of minutes. But now let me turn uh, to uh, you, Commissioner Sinkovicius. Um, you, sir, uh, are have become, or not have become, you are a strong ocean advocate. You have shown that uh, since your being appointed a EU commissioner uh, last year. Uh, you have already made tremendous progress, you yourself, uh, in helping lead the Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy of the European Union. How would this third implementing agreement fit into all of that and lead the way to the biological uh, diversity COP15 that we'll have hopefully coming up next year in China? Thank you very much for your question. And first of all, of course, let me say that I'm very happy to be part of this uh, distinguished panel today. And I want to express uh, my full gratitude to the organizers of the Paris Peace Forum and to the High Seas Alliance who spared no efforts uh, preparing this event despite the current very challenging situation. And in times like this, when uh, the daily reality is so severe, it is a 
problems have not vanished, quite the contrary. So hopefully us being here all together today will help to revive that sense of urgency. But you're asking me how a new high seas treaty is important for the EU in the context of the European Green Deal and of the EU's biodiversity strategy. Well, let me start by recalling that the European Green Deal contains the EU's roadmap to sustainable and carbon neutral growth and that it is an absolute priority for the EU. The European Green Deal is not limited to cutting carbon emissions. It also contains a number of responses to some of more uh, crucial environmental uh, related challenges of our times. One of these responses is our new EU biodiversity strategy, which is a long term plan for protecting uh, nature and reversing the degradation of ecosystems. It is a very ambitious roadmap and a clear demonstration of EU's leadership in this area of biodiversity. For example, under this strategy, the EU has committed to protect at least 30% of its marine areas by 2030 through a network of well-connected and ecologically representative areas. As I said, this is very ambitious, but yet not enough. If we want to effectively address the global biodiversity crisis, cooperation and ambition at the international level are also essential. The EU is therefore determined to lead by example and to do its utmost to help agree and adopt an ambitious new post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework at the 15th Conference of the Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Most importantly, we must ensure that this framework also includes ambitious marine targets, including a 30% goal for marine protected areas. And to achieve this, new ambitious targets, international governments, with respect to the high seas, will be an essential element. These waters that lay beyond the national jurisdiction of states are a shared good that must be protected by all of us. This is where the new high seas treaty has a key role to play if we want to take collective responsibility and action to conserve and sustainably use the high seas, including the biodiversity, we must do it now. And I believe that a new high seas treaty is the indispensable step to put an end to the downward spiral where we are and, and be able to preserve a marine life that is so essential to us and, of course, to next generation. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Sinkovicius. Um, you have just talked about uh, ambitious marine targets in terms of reversing the cycle of decline in which the ocean is immersed and uh, getting it back to recovery, getting it back to its full health. So it that can provide those uh, very important uh, elements uh, in our life, like 50% of our oxygen that Sir Richard mentioned. Um, so let me turn back to you, um, if I may, Ambassador Lee. Uh, your personal leadership, Madam Ambassador, has been very much at the forefront of pushing this forward. And as you well mentioned, we are now going into the fourth session. Uh, but going into the fourth session, we still have a lot of parts of uh, this uh, agreement in what diplomats call in brackets. In other words, parts of this that are not yet agreed upon by the negotiating parties that are the countries. What do you see, Madam Ambassador, as the most sticky points? And how can we help you get this across the finish line? How can the High Seas Alliance uh, on the side of NGOs and uh, the business community, as Sir Richard has mentioned, help you bring about a high quality third implementing agreement? Well, um, thank you very much for that question. I think that what we've been trying to do in the process is to involve um, all the different players uh, in the process, not simply uh, states, but uh, for observers, we have other international organizations. And as Sir Richard points out, the importance of involving 
business uh, in this treaty and there have been business organizations that have also participated in the process and of course civil society organizations like the high seas alliance they are also important uh, to the process i mean i think that um uh, as you know, we have a package that we're supposed to develop and each of the, and there are four specific elements in this package. Now, each of these elements, they have their own specific humps that we have to overcome in order to lead us to that successful uh, conclusion. But what I do want to encourage uh, uh, member states, uh, encourage governments uh, to do is to maybe take a step back um, from the nuts and bolts, uh, which is what, which is the work we've been doing thus far, and um, it's important work. I mean, the nuts and bolts are very vital, but to take a step back and ask ourselves, what a balanced package will look like. And uh, I mean, a number of uh, a number of the speakers also spoke about the importance of multilateralism, of us coming together, uh, and and uh, uh, working together. And I think that this is where um, now we recognize the dichotomies um, that exist, the different interests and the different concerns that different delegations have in the process. Um, I think that there is some cause for optimism because even amongst the most conservative uh, of us, there seems to be a growing recognition and support for the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and seas and their resources. So while a key focus of this support remains the development of the BBNJ Treaty, we should not lose sight of the fact that there are other processes taking place. The Commissioner mentioned COP15. Uh, we also have the Ocean Conference, which is likely to hold its second meeting meeting next year. And we will also be ushering in the UN Decade of Ocean Science, which is likely to enhance our understanding of our oceans and our seas and what we should do in order to conserve and sustainably use them. So there is this cause for optimism. But that said, we do need to make full use of the opportunity presented to us by this extended intersessional period. Uh, to bring the IGC to a successful conclusion. And I want to suggest that a successful conclusion is not simply removing all the brackets in the text, but a treaty that states will want to ratify and implement and that will achieve real results in conservation and sustainable use. To me, in order to get there, the key is balance. So I come back to the question of what a balanced package will look like. And uh, I suggest three perspectives uh, that we can look at, uh, which I encourage uh, delegations to think about. First is a balance between the various interests and concerns of the different delegations, the different interests, the business interests, the environmental interests, the, you know, uh, there are all these uh, various interests. We need to see what is that balance. Second, a balance between conservation and sustainable use. Um, and this is something that we have been discussing in the IGC itself. And third, a balance between certainty meaning what the treaty needs to say in order to provide a sufficient degree of clarity as to what we are seeking to build, and flexibility, meaning to say where do we need to give room uh, for, the, for the treaty to develop over time so that it is future-proof. And by uh, having some thoughts and having a vision of where this balance is, I believe we can reach a successful conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador. Uh, we may come back to you on those three components of what you call a, a good balance. Um, but I want to go back to your statement, if I may, of uh, uh, taking a step back from nuts and bolts, uh, you uh, said, uh, and uh, building on the growing recognition uh, of a high quality third implementing agreement and taking this time, additional time that the pandemic has given us uh, to ensure 
that it is not an average but uh, high quality. So if I may ask you, uh, Minister Girardin, uh, how do we ensure that? Uh, how do we uh, bring political leverage? Uh, and how do we get the, the political figures, the policymakers behind the negotiators uh, to ensure that this is a high quality agreement? Merci, Monsieur, Monsieur le Président. Moi, moi je crois qu'il faut qu'on redise que cette négociation euh, Baby NG, elle, elle représente une véritable opportunité euh, pour l'avenir, euh, pour protéger effectivement nos océans euh, au, niveau, euh, au niveau mondial. Et donc, c'est bien une opportunité qu'on a. Euh, vous l'avez dit et vous venez de le dire, la crise Covid peut peut-être, euh, et on peut toujours quelquefois en, en tirer du bien, c'est-à-dire nous donner le temps véritablement en 2021 euh, d'avoir un aboutissement, euh, un aboutissement con concret. Donc la France, elle est très impliquée, très impliquée sur ces sujets au, euh, au sein de l'UE, bien sûr, mais, mais elle le veut aussi euh, pour que 2021 soit, soit un succès sur ce dossier. Elle veut le faire aussi dans euh, l'ensemble de, de ces euh, relations internationales. Euh, au plus haut niveau, lors des discussions euh, bilatérales que nous avons, nous évoquons cette question euh, des océans avec euh, nos partenaires euh, chinois, avec le, le, le Japon, avec l'Inde, s'il fallait euh, n'en citer que trois. Et, et, et l'année prochaine, euh, il faut effectivement tous ensemble qu'on arrive à conclure euh, ce traité BBNJ qui doit être ambitieux et robuste. Euh, J'entends bien la notion euh, d'équilibre, mais, mais qui doit être robuste et, et, et ambitieux. Et ça, c'est important. Le commissaire euh, Sintevicius vient, vient de, de, de effectivement euh, également prendre la parole et je veux le remercier. Remercier aussi euh, l'ensemble de ses équipes qui euh, travaillent sur ce sujet euh, très durement d'ailleurs euh, au nom de l'ensemble des, de, 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 des membres des États membres de l'Union européenne. Et je salue l'engagement sans faille de, de la Commission dans cette négociation. La France s'efforce de contribuer activement au sein de cette équipe pour que cette négociation avance. Alors, il est désormais temps, et vous avez raison de le poser comme ça, désormais temps d'établir un cadre global de gouvernance pour, pour l'océan. Après des longues années de, de négociations, toutes les cartes j'ai envie de dire toutes les cartes sont sur la table. Euh, les jeux, ils sont connus. Il euh, n'y a pas euh, un pays aujourd'hui euh, qui a un atout euh, surprise dans, dans, dans sa manche. On sait donc quel est euh, le contexte, quelles sont les positions de chacun, quels peuvent être les rôles de chacun. L'heure est donc venue euh, de euh, dégager des compromis pour que euh, la dernière session de, de négociation soit conclusive. C'est bien l'objectif de la France. Les pays euh, doivent arriver à cette quatrième session euh, avec un esprit euh, ouvert et parfaitement préparé euh, à prendre des, euh, des décisions, euh, la France euh, le saura. Ces compromis euh, euh, devra ainsi nous permettre de, ce compromis devra ainsi nous permettre de nous euh, doter euh, de règles communes, euh, claires, au-delà de de des juridictions, bien sûr, euh, nationales, en vue de la création d'aires marines protégées en haute mer. C'est ce que souhaite effectivement porter la France avec beaucoup d'autres pour mettre en place euh, des études d'impact, bien sûr, euh, sur l'environnement marin, selon une approche basée sur euh, les effets plutôt que sur les activités. Euh, bien entendu, euh, on parle d'équilibre entre euh, les activités euh, existantes aujourd'hui, euh, la protection, mais, mais je crois qu'il faut qu'on regarde les, les, les effets, euh, qu'on dépasse quelque part le contexte qui nous a été donné et, et qu'on prenne un autre prisme sur euh, les, les, les effets. C'est ce que je souhaite porter pour établir un régime, bien sûr, équilibré d'accès et de partage des avantages des, des, des ressources génétiques marines en impliquant davantage les scientifiques, davantage euh, le, secteur, euh, le secteur privé. Et, et, et je crois qu'il est important là aussi, vous avez raison, Madame l'ambassadrice, c'est bien tous ensemble euh, que nous porterons au bon niveau euh, ce traité si, euh, si nous voulons le faire. Euh, la question du transfert des technologies vers les pays euh, en, en développement est aussi... Euh, une préoccupation que nous devons avoir, il y a la question des renforcements, euh, du renforcement des capacités visant à soutenir les scientifiques qui œuvrent à une meilleure connaissance euh, des océans. Cette meilleure connaissance, d'ailleurs, elle nous permettra d'être davantage transparents euh, sur les euh, décisions que nous, euh, nous prendrons. Et puis, euh, il y a euh, des thématiques qui, euh, qui sont nombreuses où les questions, effectivement, euh, restent, ou des questions qui restent en, en suspens, euh, et nous devons pouvoir euh, 
euh, y travailler euh, d'ici cette quatrième session. Il faut donc, euh, on va dire dans cette dernière ligne droite, que l'on ménage encore moins que d'habitude euh, nos, euh, nos énergies pour arriver euh, à, 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 une, à une conclusion. Je veux dire ici que euh, j'ai moi, depuis juillet, euh, euh, un rôle au sein euh, du gouvernement français avec un ministère de la mer qui vient d'être euh, créé. C'est bien la démonstration que la France euh, veut euh, aller encore plus vite dans ses euh, négociations et sur ces sujets euh, en donnant euh, euh, une visibilité plus politique euh, à, ce, à ces euh, actions. Je suis aussi une femme de la mer et des océans. Je suis née au bord de la mer. J'ai d'un côté de l'Atlantique, j'ai vécu de l'autre côté de l'Atlantique euh, et, et également, et donc j'ai à cœur de participer depuis maintenant six mois à ces travaux, même si je suis une femme qui a été très engagée dans l'accord de Paris avec les États insulaires euh, sur les objectifs de développement durable, c'est-à-dire que tout mon parcours me porte côté euh, est une voix qui euh, résonne de la même manière que ce que vous avez dit aujourd'hui. Thank you, Madam Minister, for uh, your eloquent words and, and your very clear support uh, at the highest political level of, uh, of this uh, fourth session that we will be going into uh, shortly. Um, Sir Richard, um, a few minutes ago, uh, Ambassador Lee talked about stepping back from the nuts and bolts and looking at the bigger picture. And uh, Minister Girardin has just uh, mentioned that we should uh, spare no effort in terms of going forward and making this and taking advantage of this opportunity to end up with a high quality agreement. Uh, please remind us, uh, Sir Richard, what's at stake here if we don't finish? What's at stake if we water this agreement down, if we come up with something that is just average or mediocre? What's at stake? Yeah, so uh, indeed, what is at stake here? And we know that negotiating a treaty is not an easy thing to do, particularly with just so many countries involved. Um, but we do have a once in a generation chance to get things right to make an agreement that serves the interest of all, all future generations. Um, yes, we're dealing with complex issues, but we must not let this generation's politics get in the way of a strong treaty that goes beyond maintaining the status quo. We really need a fundamental change in the way our ocean is managed and the way it is protected. And over the last two years, we've all been inspired by young people taking to the streets and demanding change demanding action. And this is our chance to listen and act for the good of our planet and for the good of these future generations. We must stop delaying action. And finally, we just must reach an agreement in 2021. And for those who are in the front line doing it, um, best of luck with you. Thank you, Sir Richard. Uh, Commissioner Sinkovicius, a lot of this comes back then to political guidance, the type of high-level political guidance that uh, Minister Girardin was uh, talking about just a few minutes ago. And the stakes are enormously high, as Sir Richard has just pointed out. In your opinion, sir, what are the key components that we need to get this over the finish line in 2021? And how can you contribute to them? Thank you for your question, and, and, and thank you for other speakers' great uh, remarks. Uh, I think, first of all, what is needed to the finish line is political courage. The courage to listen, to silence, and to do what uh, that's sort of the biggest step what's needed. The courage to make decisions, not just for the next five years or next elections, but for the future generation. And as I said before, uh, I'm convinced uh, that if we join forces in a coalition of countries from around the world, we will be able to agree on common rules that will enable the transformative change we need to protect as well as sustainably use the ocean. And we must get there. Uh, it is impressive uh, and also it is imperative if we want to uh, preserve the quality 
and continuity of, of marine life and, and more generally of all life on the Earth. The effective management of the high seas are of interest to all countries, be they coastal or landlocked, who want to be active on the high seas for use, conservation, or even research purposes. With this courage and under the wise guidance of Ambassador Lee, I believe it is possible to reach an agreement next year. But we need to keep in mind a number of key elements in the future treaty. First, uh, the agreement needs to be future-proof. For the moment, we only have limited provisions in international law on the high seas. In the next decades, we will use the ocean even more for, for our food, uh, medication, energy, even possibly living space from floating cities to offshore high seas renewables. All these activities will potentially impact marine biodiversity. So we need to create the tools now to make sure that we can properly assess the likely impact of the activities both now and in the future. Secondly, we need a transformative agreement uh, that will contribute to a holistic management of the high seas. The agreement should help uh, bring together the silos that currently characterize ocean governance. A sustainable blue economy will only be able to flourish within the limits of our planet and the ocean must be managed as a whole. So the establishment of the necessary mechanism for international cooperation and coordination is a requirement in this respect. Thirdly, improved high seas governance can only be achieved through a, an inclusive approach and we need developing countries as much as developed ones to succeed. So therefore, sufficient means must be made available to ensure developing states participation in the activities under the new treaty and to strengthen their capacities to conserve and sustainably use marine resources. Thank you, Commissioner. So we're now beginning to get some questions from the audience, uh, friends, and I would like to go to the uh, first question that we have received. Uh, I believe, Ambassador Lee, this is a question for you. Uh, the question reads as follows. Does the BBNJ treaty project include tools aimed at reassessing the evolution of global ocean environmental parameters to allow the treaty to evolve and take fast measures as follows from those changing conditions? Um, well, thank you for that question. Um, I think it, First of all, just for the benefit of those who may not be familiar, as familiar with the topic, there are four um, elements that we are working on. First is marine genetic resources, including questions on the sharing of benefits. Then we have measures such as area-based management tools, including marine protected areas. Uh, we're also looking at environmental impact assessments, as well as capacity building and transfer of marine technology. In terms of uh, assessment of the parameters, I think that they would most likely fall within area-based management tools and that includes uh, the marine protected areas and um, delegations right now are in the process of um, developing the, the mechanism uh, um, for the utilization of area-based management tools because this is something that I have um, emphasized during uh, the IGC itself which is that we should pay attention and understand how we will do things. So uh, a focus on the mechanisms and a focus on the actors within the mechanism so that all of us know what our roles are in this particular mechanism. So in terms of area-based management tools, I mean, certainly the potential is there to assess the parameters and to be able to then uh, take the necessary uh, decisions as, I guess, adaptive management um, um, of these um, areas as we utilize the tools. Um, and that is something that I think uh, delegations uh, should bear in mind. Understanding, of course, 
that there are other players in this area. And so a key part of our mandate is not to undermine existing bodies, frameworks um, and, and um, uh, instruments. And so really, I think an important part of this uh, mechanism that we're going to build is to actually bring together all the relevant actors into this mechanism so that solid um, decisions that benefit the oceans can be made. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister. Um, Commissioner uh, Sinkovicius, if, if I may uh, ask you, sir, you just talked eloquently about a transformative agreement. Um, and I want to interpret that as uh, a very high level agreement, uh, but would you care to uh, offer us a few of your comments and your thoughts on, on how it is that you qualify a transformative agreement? And if there is anything, for example, that the business community or that the NGOs such as the High Seas Alliance can help uh, in being able to conform uh, that quality of transformative agreement to the third implementing agreement? Thank you. Uh, very relevant question. And I think uh, agreement can only happen if we, if we join forces. Uh, this, is one, uh, this is one of the main reasons uh, why I want to bring the countries of the world together to achieve a successful outcome of the negotiations of this treaty in 2021. And I'm convinced uh, that joining forces and other delegations, joint forces in a coalition of countries from around the world will be able to agree on common rules that can lead to the change we need to protect and sustainably, of course, use uh, the ocean and, 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 and preserve it. Uh, but the role to play for uh, business and, and NGOs is utmost important. First of all is, of course, mobilizing society. Mobilizing society not only uh, here in the EU, but mobilizing society outside, really uh, uh, putting the message through to understand the matter. Because in the end of the day, I think uh, even so, ocean uh, surrounds us, uh, and, and, and we tend to spend uh, a lot of time, at least holidays, by the ocean. We not really uh, close enough to, to knowing the, uh, the challenges that oceans are facing especially when we're speaking about the, the high seas and what is going on there. And I think society awareness is, is important uh, because only then society can be mobilized and put additional pressures on politicians uh, to find that political courage uh, to reach uh, an agreement. And here always comes a business role who is a powerful lobby on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, Business uh, support is always welcomed by, uh, by uh, the politicians saying that there is another uh, landing zone where we can work together, uh, bringing the result which will benefit all and most importantly, save uh, our oceans and our planet to future generations. I don't think so. There is something uh, else can be uh, more profitable uh, than that. Thank you, sir. Um, Ambassador um, uh, Lee, if I may go back to you, one of the one of the points that you made was uh, you you mentioned three points, Madam Ambassador, in terms of uh, what you called balance and the necessary the necessity of balance to reach a good quality agreement, and one of them was of course the balance between conservation and sustainable use. So, if if I may. Uh, uh, tackle the issue of sustainable use. Uh, what are the arguments of countries uh, in favor of sustainable use of the high seas if today all of the economic activities in the high seas, mainly fishing, are not sustainable economically and are only possible because of the high amount of subsidies that those countries, less than a dozen, give their fishing fleets to be able to go out and fish there. Um, I mean, it would seem to many that uh, making a good part of the high seas a marine protected area would make a tremendous amount of economic sense because then you would have an area uh, that is two thirds of the ocean, 
where fish could replenish themselves and could then go into the EEZs of 144 countries that have coastlines where fishing could be enhanced. So what is the economic argument of sustainable use? Um, I, you know, obviously I'm not speaking for any particular delegation here. I think that, um, I, I think that the economic argument for sustainable use is that fishing is but one of the economic activities in uh, in the high seas. There are, and Sir Richard pointed this out, there are a number of other uh, economic activities that are occurring uh, in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so to that, um, uh, to that extent, uh, I think that uh, uh, where delegations that are placing an emphasis on sustainable use are concerned is that um, the sustainable use should not be restricted to areas within national jurisdiction, but that there is a potential for them um, to be able to use the resources of the high seas and the seabed as well. Um, and this is not to say that uh, um, this is not to say that we should use the resources to depletion. The, the the emphasis is not on the use; it's on the sustainability. So that um, I think that the the signs maybe uh, right now may be uh, potentially indicating that we do need to place a particular emphasis on conservation measures to allow some of the resources to recover, but. Um, then the question becomes when the resources recover, and we have to believe that the resources will recover with appropriate conservation measures, then how do we design um, the treaty that allows for these resources to be used sustainably? So it's not, an, uh, and I think that's what we are really talking about in terms of, in terms of uh, when I mentioned a balance, it's not a zero sum game. It's not an either or, it's really a about finding, um, understanding what can be accommodated while ensuring that um, while ensuring that the sufficient resources are, are conserved in order that future generations may also be using these resources. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Ambassador. Um, Commissioner Sinkovichis, there's a question uh, that I would like to pose with respect to the 30% uh, target of marine protected areas by 2030. Um, and there was a, a question that came in uh, from the audience in that respect, uh, whether as to the European Union's position on that. I, I think it has been very clear, but uh, please go ahead, sir. Uh, absolutely. First of all, uh, I'm proud to say today uh, uh, that uh, European Union is ready and doing so, leading by example. We already said uh, to, to ourselves in our uh, biodiversity strategy for 2030 uh, twin targets, 30% uh, of land uh, protected and 30% of marine area. More than that, actually, uh, we say that 10% of that is going to be under strict protection uh, by 2030. So, of course, uh, EU position is very clear. We are ready to lead by example. Uh, we are ready not only to uh, put this goal as a global target, but also to prove uh, that we will be the ones who are going to implement it. Uh, and by implementation, this is probably the second thing which is key to, to be addressed. We shouldn't be focused only on fancy number of 30, which is great. But in the end of the day, what matters is the, uh, how the protection is implemented. Is it a, only a paper parks or zones, uh, nice squares on the map, or it's a real protection, well connected, uh, where, uh, which we can be proud and of course, which delivers the, the results of, of flourishing biodiversity. And I think this is the two most important things which we have to bring COP15 to COP15 to China. First of all, of course, 30% target, which EU is going to be advocated and building coalition around. Secondly, of course, monitoring and implementing uh, that 
uh, the, the target is not only sort of reached on paper, but is really implemented. And this is where we're going to need uh, uh, additional effort. This is where uh, other uh, businesses and NGOs can play a important and vital, uh, vital role. But most importantly, of course, these targets have to be also be backed by sufficient resources. Commissioner, thank you so much for bringing up the uh, very important element of the quality of the protection. Uh, because, of course, as you well say, it's not only the amount, but it is how are we going to protect it and how are we going to monitor uh, the protection. So uh, backing up uh, with uh, action, uh, what we talk about. Um, Ambassador uh, Lee, does this issue of the quality of the protection come up? in the conversations that are, are being held between nations? And, 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 and how do you see that playing out? Um, I think definitely uh, delegations are concerned with um, quality of protection. Uh, and to use the example given by Commissioner Sinkovicius, I think it's not, uh, it's not just about forming paper parks. It's not just about agreeing to that. So there are provisions around monitoring and review, um, and that really speaks to uh, kind of uh, ensuring the quality. I think, um, and, and uh, when we talk about the quality of protection, I think that we mustn't lose sight of the fact that one of the important issues that we have to grapple with in the uh, treaty is the question of resources. In order to get quality results, the implementation of the treaty will require resources, not just financial resources, but also trained personnel and equipment. So government, governments will have to take a hard look at how the treaty can be adequately resourced to train the people, to build the capacity, to ensure that, you know, that in fact we can deliver a quality protection um, because we have the resources necessary to do that. Thank you uh, so much, um, Ambassador Lee. Um, Sir Richard, uh, from what you have heard from our participants here, any closing thoughts from your side, sir, as how we get this over the finish line? Well, first of all, I'd just like to say uh, thank you, Jose Maria, for all, all your time that you give uh, to, to uh, conferences like this, to all, all sorts of causes, and it's been a, a pleasure working uh, working with you over the years. Um, the, um, I think I think all I would um, sum up by saying is that um, marine reserves work; um, uh, they benefit um, everybody. Um, and what a marine reserve this would be if we could protect the high seas. Um, and to wish governments, um, a lot of the people who, who are on this panel, uh, all the best in uh, making sure that the high seas do get protected. And um, what a legacy for our, for our children and grandchildren. Thank you, Richard. So friends, we're coming to the conclusion of this panel. I want to uh, thank uh, Minister Girardin, uh, Ambassador Lee, uh, and Commissioner Sinkovicius, not only for sharing their thoughts here, but for their active leadership. I also want to thank you, Richard, for bringing the private sector behind the importance of achieving a high quality third implementing agreement, as well as praise the work of the High Seas Alliance and the coalition of NGOs that are helping on a daily basis get this over the finish line. There is no more important ecosystem in our lives than the ocean. 50% of the oxygen, every second breath in our lives. It fixes 25% of carbon emissions. That has an economic value of about over $200 billion per year. And it has absorbed 93% of the heat increase caused on the planet by climate change, which otherwise would have us with temperatures of plus 36 degree centigrade. We, humanity, at the United Nations, have committed that by the year 2030, we will be preserving in protected areas 30% of the ocean. The high seas is an important component of that, 
because without protecting the high seas, there is no way we can get to 30%. Protecting the high seas makes scientific validation, and it also makes economic sense. Moving on this agenda is of utmost importance, and we thank you all discussion leaders and participants for your helps and your efforts in this endeavor. Thank you so much and be well.